So in John chapter 14, verse 27, picking up from where we left off last week after Jesus spoke about the roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives as believers, He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Let's pray. Father God, as we submit time to you, time in your word, I pray you develop us into better disciples of you. That each day as we walk with you and talk with you, that we become a reflection of you, Jesus, to the world. I pray in this moment we've set aside that the words and meditations of my mouth be pleasing in your sight. What I present to the members of Harris Park Bible Church is based out of your word, out of truth, and allows for the edification, for the encouragement of those gathered here. And we love you, Lord, and we praise you for everything that you continue to do here at Harris Park Bible Church. And bring us revelation knowledge of what peace is, even today just as you knew it to be some 2,000 odd years ago. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. December 24th of 1914 might not seem like a big deal to you now in 2020. But think about it in this way. During 1914, World War I was dragging on longer than anticipated in Europe. And we had both the British and the Germans in different trenches in opposition in the south area of Belgium. On the 24th, scouts reported that they began to see the Germans setting up Christmas trees in front of the trenches. And then they reported that they began to see them setting lights beside the Christmas trees. And as we progress further into Christmas Eve of 1914, what the Britain, British people heard was Christmas carols. Now they didn't recognize them as Christmas carols by the words because of course the German soldiers were singing in German. But they recognized old familiar tunes that they had grown up with that they even sang like the first Noel and Silent Night. And as it became clear that this was a time to just sit and ponder in the trenches that they had been expecting to leave some time ago, they began to sit and think to themselves, maybe, just maybe, something's happening here. And in fact, something was, because we know from historical records that what occurred that night is beyond explanation. What occurred that night was a Christmas truce. And it's recorded by multiple historians, and these aren't religious historians by any means, but a Christmas truce occurred on the 25th, on Christmas Day of 1914, in December, in South Belgium. And what happened is that the Germans along their lines came out of their trenches, and the Brits along their lines came out of their trenches, and they met in the middle of no man's land, where no one wanted to be at any point in time. And yet on Christmas Day of 1914, that's exactly what both armies did. And there were gifts exchanged of whiskey and cigars. There were jokes traded as much as they could understand each other. There was a few games of soccer that ended up occurring during this time in the middle of no man's land. It's recorded that one German soldier in fact said, We are Anglo and you are Anglo-Saxon. What are we really fighting about? All this to emphasize the fact that there was in fact a moment, if however brief, of peace in Belgium, in South Belgium. A moment of peace where people laid aside their rifles and their differences and their helmets and their armor to enjoy being together on Christmas Day. Of course, that time was briefly lived and the next day shots were fired and once again the men of war returned to the crude art of war. But just for a moment, on Christmas Day, 
of the 25th of December of 1914, two opposing armies experienced peace. And I think the timely word for today brings us in that same scenario that we can relate to just like these soldiers. Because you see in our lives so many times as believers what we experience is brief glimpses or moments of peace. We experience the everyday battle of life sometimes. We wake up and we're experiencing health issues ourselves or our spouse is dealing with health issues. Or we're experiencing spouse, spousal estrangement or relational dynamics with children where they openly reject you. And so when we get those small moments of peace, we cling to them. We clamor for them. And yet, we go back into the trenches of our life the next day and walk out anything but peace. And I believe what happens in John 14, 27 is that Jesus gives us a view, beautiful view, a beautiful view of peace and an underlying truth amidst the passage of John 14, 27. That the product of peace is from the prince. Therefore, we should prioritize the prince. Amen. The product of peace nice. is from the prince. And therefore, we should prioritize the prince. And I think he goes about it in three ways. So that's what I want to unpack with you all today. I want to unpack with you all how we go about prioritizing the prince of peace and by doing so, we experience his product, which is peace. If you'll dive back in with me, the first part of verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you. Jesus states, Peace I leave with you. How do we go about prioritizing the prince? The first thing we have to do, like Jesus did when he was talking to his disciples, about this very issue is that we as believers must proclaim peace. We must proclaim peace. Jesus stated, peace I leave with you. And if you're any what somewhat familiar with Hebrew culture, even today, the word shalom is used, which I'll touch in a little bit, but it's a very, very cultural greeting. It's, it's very familiar to say, peace I leave with you, peace I greet you with, in Hebrew tradition. And so for Jesus to explain this is very culturally relevant in his day and age. But by and large, it's bigger than that, because what Jesus does by proclaiming peace is that he doesn't address the issue first, the problem that's about to rise up the issue at large. Because remember, contextually, if we're reading from John 14, this is the Last Supper. These are the last moments that Jesus is getting to spend with his disciples before he walks to the Garden of Gethsemane and then is taken by the Roman soldiers before Pontius Pilate and then hung on a cross. Before the disciples all disperse in fear, Peter denies him three times, there's problems that Jesus knows about. There's problems that are going to be coming up here that he's very aware of as the Son of God. And he's very aware of those things, and he's not denying those things. In fact, in the, in the book of Mark, he makes it clear in three times throughout the book of Mark that he predicts his death. So Jesus is very aware of the issue, of the problem, and yet he chooses in verse 27 to first open up by proclaiming peace. In our culture, I think that's a hard thing to come to. And I, but, I think it's where Jesus is inviting us into in prioritizing the prince. And the reason is because we are so problem-solution oriented. What do I mean by this? I did an undergrad in business, and one of the first things we work through in our undergrad in business, and we work in management, I'm a, I'm a manager currently at Chick-fil-A along with several people here. But one of the things we work through, and Ian can attest to it as I meet with Ian on a week-to-week -week basis about this, 
is we identify the problem. That's one of the first rules of business in any area, whether you choose to do marketing or you choose to do consultation or you choose to build a business. You have to identify the problem. We go to the problem first. So by and large, after we recognize the problem, we can then build towards solutions that go past that. But here, Jesus flips that script. He proclaims peace to his disciples, despite all the problems that are about to come up, despite all the problems that he knows are just moments, just hours away. He chooses in that moment not to address them. He doesn't say, gentlemen, we're coming to a point where I'm going to go be taken by Pontius Pilate and the Romans. I'm going to be castigated. I'm going to be lied against. I'm going to be voted to be hung on a tree. But don't worry, I'm going to give you peace. No, instead, he proclaims peace first. And in our lives, I think we should and must do the same exact thing. We ought to proclaim peace in the problems that we have. There's no denying the problems that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no denying that maybe you have a falling out with one of your children. There's no denying that there's health issues with your spouse. There's no denying that perhaps you're frustrated or angry or upset or saddened by the state of our political world or our society at large. There's no denying those things, and Jesus isn't doing that. But he is asking the first thing we ought to do in prioritizing the prince is proclaim peace. Peace. So prioritizing the prince starts by proclaiming peace. That's what we see in the start of verse 27. Peace I leave with you. But then Jesus goes on and moves on into this qualifying measure. I said there's three ways that we must work towards behavioral things that we must take on to prioritize the prince and by and large receive the product, which is peace. And he says in verse 27, My peace I give to you. Not as the world do I give to you. And so the second behavioral thing we need to take on in order to work towards prioritizing the prince in our seasons <coughs> with me is diagnose differences. Diagnose differences. Jesus diagnoses the disti and distinguishes the peace that the world gives compared to the peace he gives. Think about that. He says, peace, I leave you. But he qualifies it following up, stating that it is my peace that I'm giving, I'm leaving with you. It's not the world's peace but my peace, and there is a distinct difference. I mentioned the word shalom prior. Shalom, as I have come to study and understand it, is a wholeness and completeness of body, mind, and soul only found by letting God's Word saturate your life. Nice. It is expressed through how we live our lives amidst the ups and downs with the Holy Spirit which I spoke on last week, helping, teaching, and reminding us of the Word and the love the Father has for us. That is the kind of peace that Jesus promises to leave us. More simply put, it is the life God had intended it to be, processed inwardly and lived outwardly for us as the disciples of Jesus. Now we want to talk about the reality that the world will offer options and opportunities or alternatives for peace. And we can think about that in just paying for insurance for a vehicle. We can think about that in paying for a warranty. You better get that warranty so you can have a peace of mind. You better invest in stocks and bonds and play the market right so you can have a peace of mind going into your retirement, into your golden years. But yet, 
The world cannot offer what Jesus offers. Amen. At the end of the day, a warranty has a time limit. At the end of the day, insurance, you pay each month. And if you don't pay it, it ends. Yet Jesus promises shalom, a distinctly different kind of peace. A peace that is eternal. And John Piper, Pastor John Piper says this about peace that Jesus offers. He says, the peace that Jesus gives is not circumstantially based. It is a peace in bad circumstances, in tribulation, in no health insurance, and in no police, and in police breakdown, in societal breakdown. It's in these things we have peace, the peace that surpasses all human comprehension. Amen. That is the kind of peace. We have to be, as believers, wise and prudent through the Holy Spirit in diagnosing the differences of the kind of peace that are being offered up to us and what, in fact, we are supposed to operate in. The shalomic peace that Jesus offers. And you can see that unpacked in, verses, in verse 27 of John 14. So remember, we need to proclaim peace then we move from a point of proclaiming peace in and through our situations. We proclaim peace. We don't deny the problem exists. We don't renounce it. But we understand that we can proclaim peace over it, over our situation. And then from there we move to a point where we are able to diagnose the differences. So that when the world comes and offers their peace, their view and understanding of peace, their nuanced, high intellectual thought of peace, you can say, no, I have the peace of Jesus. And it's a shalomic peace. Scripture says it guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The last point that we need to move into in order to understand this peace is that we must forego fear. We return to verse 27, and it states, Jesus states himself, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. See, Jesus just got done proclaiming peace, and he just got done diagnosing the differences between his shalomic peace for your life and what the world will offer for peace in your life. But then, he closes with an instruction, a distinct instruction, not an invitation, not an ask, but an instruction to his disciples, stating unequivocally, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be fearful. We as believers in 2020, amidst a lot of fear, amidst a, against a media that drives fear and is the catalyst for all things fearful, we must forego fear in light of peace. He invites us not to deny what's happening. In fact, as we move out, because he says later at the end of the passage, let us depart from here, and scholars believe that he goes from there, and the rest of the passages that we read of John are shared either along the walk to Gethsemane or in Gethsemane itself. And so Jesus lays really heavily into this idea that there's going to be a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. And he even says in chapter 16, do not let your heart be troubled. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus doesn't deny these things are coming up. He doesn't, he doesn't try to mask it and say, oh no, it's not actually what you see, or I'm not actually going to die, it's just going to appear like I die. He simply states, do not be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Think about it in the context of your life. When we allow fear, my friends, to inundate to take hold of our hearts, we freeze. 
I know when I first started working in drama club that I did through high school, and my parents would come and see some of the plays, or all the plays I did, not some, <laughs> all the plays, very supportive. At first, one of the things that I had to work on was just being fearful. Because fear would root you into a spot on stage where you stand and you have a deer, what they call that deer in the headlights look. And you just look dead man ahead. Mm -hmm. I forgot my lines. Yep. And you stand there forever. I forgot my lines. But as you rehearse, what you find is that there's a teacher that sits down below that knows all the lines, has the full playbook, has the full has the full play right in front of them. And as you stand there with that deer in the headlights look rehearsing, you can say, line please. And all of a sudden you see, even me, you, you experience this out of body experience where fear leaves because you were given the prompting and the word. That's what Jesus is asking you to do. Do not be fearful. Imagine yourself in a space, in that similar space where you're standing on the stage of life and we're called to work in and through this stage of life. And you're standing there and all of a sudden life approaches you, something unexpected, and you're glued in fear on the stage of life. And you're looking out. But imagine Jesus, the director, the one who knows it all, who's even crafted and built this beautiful narrative for you, for the stage of your life. And all you have to do is say, bring to remembrance your word, your holy word, and allow it to be saturated into my life. That, my friends, is the kind of peace you can experience. And it's that easy to access. Line, please. That's all you have to say to the director, Jesus. Because he's sitting right there, viewing your life, seeing all the moving pieces, all the people that come in and out of your life, just like a play. And all you have to say is, line, please. Bring to my remembrance the words that you spoke. Bring to my remembrance the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Bring to my remembrance that you are a good and holy Father. Bring to my remembrance that you love me. Bring to my remembrance that you're going to provide through the financial crisis. Bring to my remembrance that my spouse is hurting or in pain, and yet I am there to comfort them and love them, and that you are my strong tower that I run to in times of trouble. That you're the good shepherd of Psalms 23 and you lead me beside quiet waters and you restore my soul. That kind of peace is so accessible in the moment. And the beautiful thing that I shared last week is the reality is, friends, that when we forego fear in light of peace, it doesn't mean we have to have the words to say. The Holy Spirit does that for us at times. In some of the darkest days that you have experienced or will experience, the Holy Spirit, it says, prays on our behalf. And that He takes those prayers and issues them to the Father. And He whispers them in the Father's ear. That's the kind of peace that will be brought to you if we choose to forego fear. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not be fearful. Jesus says this all in one small little verse of John 14, 27. And we must adopt an attitude and behaviors that allow us to prioritize the prince, to receive the product which is peace. And how do we do that? How do we go about receiving this product of peace? For our lives. Let me read again from John 14, 27. Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. We must proclaim peace over our situation first. We have to proclaim peace. And then we diagnose the difference between what the world offers as peace and what Jesus offers as peace. His shalom. And then finally, we forego fear. We choose to forego fear and instead go to the Savior, the Prince of Peace. How do we live this out in practical ways? 
I was really wrestling with the Spirit on how I wanted to just bring you all to this complete and overwhelming realization of how this is lived out. And I thought no more appropriate time as the Spirit brought it to me in the wee hours of the morning this morning because I don't want these sermons to be anything less than what the Spirit brings me. And that's what I do in my time of preparation, but as well as my time right before the message is shared. And what was brought to mind to me was this. Back my senior year of high school, starting my senior year of high school, and forgive me if I get a little emotional about this because it, it, the Holy Spirit really did prompt this reminding. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. She is a survivor of breast cancer, and we thank God every day that she is here. Yes. Yeah. But I was assigned a task in undergrad school to write about someone that I love deeply and just review kind of how their life, uh, the, the class I had to write for was Christian worldview, and I had to write a reflection paper on someone who was seeing God lived out in their life and their experience in that. And so I had decided to write about mom. And she wrote a letter to me that I still have that talked about her experience with breast cancer after walking through it. And she talked about a lot of things that were made clear, made very um, aware to her by God as she walked through that season in light of everything going on. Because you can imagine with cancer, those of you that have loved ones, I think cancer is only has to in some way or fashion. And I remember a line that my mother wrote in her experience through this time and this trial and tribulation that emphasizes the need to prioritize the prince who brings peace. She wrote that it was super important prior to her experience that the house was clean when people came over. <laughs> that was something that was super important. And she wrote about how she loved, you know, she, didn't, she, she isn't a vain person by any stretch of the imagination, but she did enjoy, and most, I think all women, it's safe to say, enjoy their hair. It's just something that helps identify them as a woman. Why? <laughs> so one of the things she wrote is she loved both those things, and she, you know, she loved both those things. But one of the things the Lord brought her in this season of tribulation and trial was that it's not so important to have a clean house. Because there were times when she was so sick that she didn't have the energy even to get out of bed, let alone clean a house. She also said that it wasn't so important to have a nice head of hair because she ended up losing it all during that time and doing chemo. And I actually remember shaving my head as well during that time for her. She said those were two things that she brought out of that experience with God. But the last one is the one that I want to drive home to you. Because she wrote that she went through hell holding Jesus' hand in her right and my father's in her left. She went through hell and back with those two men. Can you imagine the kind of peace that you have access to if you're willing to take the hand of Jesus now? The kind of peace that our world can see if we were to introduce Jesus to the people rioting? If we were to introduce Jesus to your relatives that are lost and hurting and say mean, nasty things about you, to people that don't see the same politically or in terms of the worldview they have, can you imagine the kind of world that we could live out if only we offer and introduce the Prince of Peace and say, take his hand, just like my mother did back then? What kind of peace could we experience if we chose to prioritize the Prince and then enjoy his product, which is peace? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in your house. A house that is set up on a hill that bears a light for the county of Park County here, and I believe for the world. 
through their missions and through their food bank. And I pray today you utter in, usher in peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray and I know that the Prince of Peace is here. And that He is fully present and fully able to take on the load of each and every member here. Nothing is too heavy for you, Lord. Nothing is too outside of your power. Nothing that you have not seen, Father God. And so we draw together in prayer, issuing forth a proclamation of peace over Harris Park Bible Church, over Pastor Alex and the Probst family as they serve and lead this church, over the pantry workers we proclaim peace, and over each individual circumstance, each individual hurt physically, emotionally, relationally, fiscally, we proclaim your peace. And we ask that you bring in the shalomic peace. We don't want to see the world's peace through insurance or through warranties. We want to experience your shalomic peace, Father God. And we pray that, Father God, we forego fear. Fear of a virus, fear of race relation breakdowns, fear of hate against police, fear of the unknown the remainder of the year. We forego peace and instead choose to go to the Prince of Peace right now. We thank you, Father God, for your goodness, for your mercies, and for your peace. And we go in your name today and celebrate the fact that you have won the victory. And that you sit at the right hand of the Father Jesus and that your Holy Spirit is inside of us. Leading and guiding us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And asking us to step in prioritizing the Prince of Peace and enjoying exactly that. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Are there any questions? Questions?